uh, deity, usually. But basically, religion is anything that a person does. And that makes your religion, whatever you do, based on your own belief, not coercion now, not when you are forced to do things. That's not a religion. But when you voluntarily do anything based on your own beliefs, your beliefs, not tampered with by anybody else, but that's because you're doing it because you want to do it. That is indeed that person's religion, regardless of what kind of label they put on it. Like, down through the years, I've heard people say things like, I'm a Catholic, but I don't practice it. Well, if you're going to be truthful and logical about that, how can you be something that you don't do? If you're an airplane pilot, you fly airplanes. Otherwise, it's just a label. So whenever you're not doing whatever you say that your religion requires you to do, then you are not practicing your religion which means that's not your religion. It's not your religion because you said it was. Not somebody else said it was. You said it was, but you are not doing it. So how can it be yours? And what makes you different from anybody else if you're not doing what you say that you're supposed to be doing? People of other religions. I just threw that in there because religion is very powerful and politics is very powerful. The way that people interact with each other. But all of these areas of activity all deal with people, law, education, entertainment, and uh, sex, very powerful, all right, among people. One of the second greatest powerful force among people of the planet, second to the system of white supremacy. It comes in second. People consider race before they consider sex. And and sex, you know, people get all upset about how sex is handled when it comes to color. But they get upset when it comes to color in any area of activity. Just, you know, by the evidence, not by what Neely Fuller says. And that's the one thing I want to emphasize in answer to this question. Test it yourself, because that's what I started doing. I started testing, okay, the field of economics. Who has more say-so about how time and energy and money, money is just a tool of economics, all right? It's not the driving force. It's how you use your time and energy, how you use your brain power. That's the real money, all right, in economics, all right? Uh, Ignorant people do not know very much about how to use time and uh, and energy as compared with what? People who are not ignorant about how to use time and energy. And the non-white people in the second area of activity, education, the white supremacists suppress their knowledge in the field of education or they dissipate it. They'll tell you that you're educated when you're not. They'll give you a piece of paper as a part of their scheme and say, you are now an educated person. And they'll put their signature on that piece of paper. And that validates you as now being educated. And then they walk down the block and snicker to themselves. They giggle, you might say, to to give a dramatic illustration, saying, (laughs) you know, he thinks he's educated because I told him he was. He doesn't know anything except what I told him. All these black people around here who are talking about their certificates of education, they got them from me. I validated their so-called education, and they believe they're educated. They can't do anything except what I say do, because that's how I educated them. At a gut level, Young black people who drop out in the ninth grade, that's usually the time when they begin to say, wait a minute, what's going on here? They can perceive that, but they can't put it all together in their minds. Why? Because of one major thing. The things that it seems like they're supposed to be learning are not solving problems. And what do they measure that by? Where did they get that from? They got it from looking at the world around them when they walk out of that classroom. And they say, I got a, a, a thousand and one problems. 
as a ninth grade student, black student. And when I look at the older people, I see they got problems. Now, where are all these problems coming from? They're not supposed to have any problems. I mean, they're supposed to be guiding me, and they're talking about their problems. My dad is left. He's no longer in the house. Two months after I was born, he was gone. All right? And my brothers and sisters don't have no answers to nothing. They out here snorting drugs and all like that. My mother, she's running herself ragged. My grandmother is just about giving up. I mean, and these people sitting behind these desks and these fancy institutions are not giving me no immediate answers to everything that I need right this minute. Right this minute, not somewhere down the road or somewhere in the future, somewhere based on some dream. I got to have help right today. Is there anybody anywhere in any of these corridors of any of these universities that can give me any kind of sign of what to do and what not to do about everything that I'm going to encounter. And they say, well, get your education. Well, that's what I'm doing. But where are the problems that haven't been solved? See, and I, this is a long-winded answer to that question, but it takes a long-winded answer sometimes for it to sink in. So I said, that what we need, because I'm talking about solutions now, is a code in each one of those areas of activity. That's the missing link. Now, do I have the code? No, I'm trying to start one because someone asked me, well, Fuller, you're talking about this code that you'll come up with to solve problems. I mean, has it done it? I say, no, there's no such thing as a complete code until all problems are solved. That's in anything. That's in the universe. You have a problem, you solve it. If you don't have a solution to a problem, it means you don't have a code for solving problems. And you say, well, we are trying. Well, nobody tries like black people. Now, when you start putting, use that word T-R-Y. Right. Hold that thought right there, Neil. We got to take a short break again. Hold that thought right there. We've got to check the traffic and weather in the DMV. I'll let you finish your thought on the other side. Folks, you two can join us uh, discussing racism and white supremacy with Neely Fuller Jr. Take your calls next on FM 95.9 and AM 1450. WOL, where information is power. Thank you for staying with us, folks. Our guest is Neely Fuller Jr. You know, some of you know him as Dr. Welting's mentor. Racism and white supremacy is on the table. And Dr. Fuller, I'm going to let you finish your thought. And when you finish, uh, we got a tweet question once you know if white racism white supremacy means that white all white folks are superior or some or just some are superior that's that's the the hang up that a lot of people have in your theories but i'll let you finish your thought and then you can uh, attack that question for us thank you well i'll just go right to that question because uh every question is supposed to have an answer uh most of the answers to the questions uh most answers that i give to most questions like most people on the planet is i don't know and so in this particular case I don't know about superiority, if you're talking about genetic superiority. Now, a lot of people study that. I don't know anything about that. I just look at cause and effect. Cause and effect. And that is, I I came to the conclusion based on evidence, because I tell people, never believe anything that Neely Fuller says. Never, under any circumstance. Go check it for yourself and see what you run into. See what you run into if you are a person of color, because I say that the system of white supremacy is the dominant religious and political force on this planet in 2018. Dominant, meaning nothing is more powerful than that. No system of government, no no so-called communism, no so-called capitalism, no so-called socialism. No so-called religion or even genuine religions. Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Confucianism, none of them have the muscle, have proven it. If you don't believe it, just check it out yourself. I mean, just pay attention to details and see 
what happens when the white supremacists come around anybody's religion or anybody's political system and say, hey, that's bad for my business. See, because white supremacy is a business. It's not a matter of emotions and feelings or hating somebody. That's not what white supremacy is about. It's about getting over on people. And there are precise laws for doing that. And the white supremacy supremacists have been better at it than anybody in recorded history at coming up with a precise code, a white code, that says that if you're white, you are supposed to dominate every situation when you're around people who are classified as non-white. Classified by whom? Classified by me if I'm white. I do the classifying. And I change the classifications. That goes to show how much power, power I have. I even change the classifications when it comes to sex. People say, well, we got male and we got female. And I say, yeah, you had that up to the time that I decided that I want to run a game on non-white people. So I'm now saying, oh, no, there are, about, there are three types of sexuality. All right. And then next week I'll say, oh, well, now, hey, you know, I know you, you people don't know nothing. No way. Uh, there are five types. All right. Okay. That's the limit as of now. All right. But. Twelve months from now, it might be 40 types. Why? Based on what? Based on I said so, Negro. I said so. Forty types of sexuality and counting. All right? Come and check with me next week, and there might be 50 types. Or I might go back to 30 types, depending on what I need to do to keep you what? Confused. Because it's a law of mathematics and a law of the universe that the person who can confuse everybody else is the most powerful person on the planet or the most powerful person out of 10 people in a room. If you don't believe it, try it yourself, just as an experiment. If you can go into a room with nine people and you're the 10th person and you confuse those nine people, you will instantly become the most powerful person in that room, not outside that room, but in that room. Now, the white supremacists came up with that formula because it's a formula of the universe. Anybody could have done it. And they said, we're going to convince people that if you have color in your skin, you are nothing. Nothing compared with what? To a person who is something. Well, who would that person be? Something, somebody who is classified as white. You say, well, I'm quite sure this conversation had to take place back and forth between the people who set up the system of white supremacy. And probably they said, do you think that will really work? And they said, well, maybe and maybe not, but we can try it. Well, somebody tried it, and it turned out to be the greatest formula in the world for dominating and mistreating people. And they just say that, yeah, well, if you've got color in your skin, you're inferior. Well, why am I inferior? Because I got color in my skin. Because you got color in your skin. Read my lips. What did I just tell you? Are you thick-headed? Are you dumb? What did I tell you? I tell you you had color in your skin. Your skin is dark. D-A-R-K. Black. Brown. Red. Yellow. You have some color in your skin. That makes you inferior. Inferior to whom? To me. Well, where did you get that? Where did it just come from, boy? I just told you. And for some strange reason, they kept doing that, kept saying that, and it it took root. And we see evidence of it every day in everything all over the world not based on what Neely Fuller is saying. Anybody who hasn't looked at it or hadn't put it to an ultimate test, I will guarantee you, you'll find that out. Because I was trying to find a place somewhere on this planet where that wasn't true. I never even heard of one. Never even heard of one. I've talked to people who have, I haven't traveled that much, but I've talked to people who have traveled. They say, oh, Fuller, you're just in a little bubble. You know, that's how you got that idea, born in the South and whatnot. Man, you don't know about the real world and all like that. 
Nobody said that to me. Not yet. Not anybody who has really gone to take a look. Everybody that I have talked to has said, man, I didn't want to believe what you were saying, but it's true. <laughs> it's true. Sometimes you've got to dig for it because they're real slick. Some parts of the world, they're slicker than others. You've got to dig for it sometimes, but it's there. It's at the root of everything that goes on, and I had to find out the hard way. That's what I've had everybody tell me, not for just five or six years, but as long as I've been on this planet. Now, the people who have said it ain't so, maybe, I don't know, maybe they have been in that bubble. But all I do is just ask them, go take a look. At this paradise that you're talking about, where color doesn't matter, go take a look. And if you come back and tell me that it exists, I want a person to check that out. If I can. Yeah, let me interrupt you. Anything. Right. Let me interrupt you and ask you this thing. Having said that, because you know there's a lot of people who are so rigid in in their thoughts. They they think that they they think they know everything. You can't confuse them that there's a different idea out there or, or there's a different ideology or something they should even listen to. They won't even listen to it because they are they have a they draw a line in the sand and say, I don't believe that. This is what I believe and I'm sticking to my convictions. What do you do with folks like that? The code, the code that I've written, a textbook for victims of white supremacy, I say, I call it VGQ. I made up a term for it because you have to make up terms in the system of white supremacy. Otherwise, you can't really defeat it. Victims guaranteed qualification. That is discussed in the book, uh, presented in the book. It means if you're a victim of white supremacy, you have complete control over what you decide should be done about it. I mean, you shouldn't take Neely Fuller's word. I say that. Start with Neely Fuller or anybody else's word. I recommend, you know, just do what you think will work. And even go around, if you believe that racism doesn't exist, just act like it doesn't exist. In all nine areas of activity, economics, education, entertainment, I've heard black people say, don't know white folks tell me what to do, no time. You know, anyway, you know, hey, I'm... Hey, I I got my own mind. I do it. I've heard that over and over again, but I've seen it put to a test, and the person who was saying it always backed down. Always, I've never seen an exception to that rule. Not one. Okay, so that but that's just me. But I will let the world know I have had the experience of everybody else. So therefore, I can't speak for everybody. I'm just saying what my experiences are. And that's on the back of my book. I'm just talking from my experiences and observations and everybody that I've talked to since I've been on this planet, okay? And so I came to these conclusions tentatively, and hopefully I still hope I could be in error. I hope that everything that I've said is in error because then the world would be the type of place that it ought to be. But I haven't seen any evidence of that. I've been looking for my own errors and haven't found them. All right. So that's what you say in answer to that question. What do you say to people to go with what your gut or what your intelligence or what all these mysterious people that you have talked to have told you about racism and whatnot and, and implying maybe or saying outright that it's not it's not the be all see all and you've got color in your skin. Go with it. Go with it all the way in all areas of activity, and then see where it, and, if, and here's what I've always told people, when you find that there's a formula that you have used that always works, dealing with the color issue, I will be the first to step forward, and, and if it tests out, I will say, man, you got it. And everybody should have this, because we're still talking about, in 2018, Black Lives Matter, just like this is 1900. I mean, we've got too many contradictions here. If Black Lives Matter in 2018, you know, that means we must have a race problem, even to have to say that. 
because if black lives really matter, you shouldn't have to say it. It's like you shouldn't have to walk around with a sign saying, I am a man. The white supremacists don't walk around with a sign ever saying, I am a man. Why? Because they take for granted that, hey, if you're a white male, you're a man. Period. At any age. That's why if you're a black male, you're a boy. At any age. Period. And you'll say, I ain't no boy. I'm 21 years old. Well, who told you you are a grown when you were 21? Oh, uh, well, I learned that when I was a little boy. You learned it from whom? You're in a system of white supremacy. You'll never be a man in the system of white supremacy. And you know who will prove it to you? The man. That's why we call him that. We call him that. They didn't give them themselves that title. Y'all, it'll be quiet. He come to man. That or some type of derivative of that expression I've heard as far back as I can remember. And I still hear it in 2018. Why? Because it's true. That's why. Yeah, that's the bottom line. You got hundreds and hundreds and thousands of black people right now as we speak with their babies right. in their arms. Hold that thought right there, nearly full of June. We've got to take a short break here so some of our stations can identify themselves. I'll let you finish your thought on the other side. We've got some people who want to speak to you. 800-450-7876. You, too, can join the conversations. We'll take a call next on FM 95.9 and AM 1450. WOL, where information is power. Thank you for staying with us, folks. Our guest is Neely Fuller, Jr. Neely Fuller is uh, uh, Dr. Wilson's uh, mentor. A number to call to speak to him, 800-450-7876. She often spoke about Neely Fuller, and they share the same sentiment about racism, white supremacy, and they both claim if you don't understand how this matrix works, everything else that you think you understand will only serve to confuse you. Neely, I'm going to let you finish, and then we've got some people who want to speak to you on the phone. Yes, sir. So, even as I speak right now, this is 2018, there are people falling into oceans, dark-skinned people, with one thing in mind. I mean, I'm not saying what I'm saying about them. I'm saying what they say when they speak. I mean, exhausted. Babies in their arms. Dragging off of a boat. Relieved that they could get to some land after being on the ocean for days. In the baking hot sun. Or with, with salt water sprayed all over them and all like that. And under filthy conditions and whatnot. Like slaves. Okay, so they get to somewhere, and they have one question in mind, in whatever language they speak, but it boils down to one thing. Which way did the white people go? That's 2018, right now. This is going on as I speak right now, according to what? According to what I'm saying? No, according to what I read and hear. Now, what I'm reading and hearing could be a lie. So people can check that out, but I don't think so, because I believe that. I believe that's happening, because I have gone from one place to another, and I had a different way of putting it. I say I'm looking for a job, but what I was looking for, which way did the white people go? All right. Now, I'm not making this up. I've seen a whole bunch of black people. That's what they were really saying with their feet and packing their bags. They weren't putting it in words, but they were always saying, I'm looking for a job. I'm looking for a house. I'm looking for an education. I'm looking for this. I'm looking for that. Anything of constructive value. And you can boil it all down to one question. Which way did the white people go? Because me with my dark skin... I know I better get out here and find some. Otherwise, I ain't going to know what to do about nothing and can't solve no problems at all, period. Which way did the white people go? You say, oh, well, that ain't true. What about the black presidents of countries and whatnot? I still say the same thing. That black president of that so-called country sitting behind that polished desk Got the same question. Which way did the white people go? You're going to pick up that phone and try to get in contact with some 
if he's going to have anything that's running in the modern world, telecommunications, all of that. Get them in here. Oh, man, I'm gonna get, there's going to be a coup if I don't get them in here. And my own people are going to rise up against me and throw me in the ocean. Get some, get some white folks in here right quick, right now. Otherwise, them ships out there in that harbor are not going to even move. Because when they move, they've got to be going somewhere. And you've got to get authorization from whom? Directly or indirectly. Those white people, not talking about all white people, but those white people who are white supremacists. They're the most powerful people that the world has ever seen. And if you got color in your skin, you are beholden to them for everything that you get that is of value and a whole bunch of junk that is not of any value. Like black culture in 2018, no value at all, zero. All right, hang on a sec. 800-450-7876. Jimmy's calling us from Houston. Jimmy, you're on Neely Fuller, Jr. Hey, Carl Nelson. How you doing, Neely Fuller? I'm still learning. All right. Um, I was going to um, – hey, I'm in agreement with you, man. It's the, it's the most powerful is, um, um, system here. Um, I was going to ask you about um, – this. my statement was um, – what are your thought about with the Yemen till? I mean, if, if people don't understand what you're saying logically, I mean, you can just look at the Yemen till situation. Why is they bringing it up after all these years now? And I go with your logic because I because I say so. Um, if people don't think um, that the system is is um, supreme, I mean, that's the example right there. You know, they brought it up. I mean, I think for distraction purposes, but. They, um, we didn't, we didn't have, we don't have the power to actually bring it up. It's when they say so. For whatever reason, they bring the Emmett Till case back up. So I, I want to know what was your, what's your thought about them bringing the Emmett Till case back up? Is that a, is that a, um, 52 fake out, you know, just for distraction because of, uh, a lot of other things that's going on? Well, the white yeah. supremacists do all sorts of things, but it's one thing you can count on. If a white person believes in white supremacy, there's one thing you can count on. They do not make any move of any kind, ever, unless it's going to add strength to the system of white supremacy. And they are so deceitful at making these moves. They're the best checker players ever when it comes to racism, okay, and counter-racism. They know what moves black people are going to make more black people even think about making the move. All right, because after all, <laughs> they raised us, if you can call it raising. I mean, we haven't had no teacher other than them, okay? So they give us all our values. They tell us that a pair of shoes is more important than a black person's existence. All you got to do is put a label on the side of it. And you can get that black person killed this evening right by his own schoolmate. We'll kill him. Not for the shoes, because he's already wearing shoes. It's for the label that's on the shoes. You will die. You will die a miserable death by the hand of somebody that lives three blocks from you. Anywhere you find black people on the planet, we will slaughter each other because the white supremacists say, kill him. For that pair of shoes that I gave you, boy, you know, and I knew when you walked out of here, that was your death sentence. I sold you those shoes for $700, and I figured by the time you got halfway where you were going, you were going to be dead. I already knew that when I sold you the shoes, and I knew who was going to kill you, all right? And I'm going to get a two for the day. Cause and I want to say I knew that you were going to get killed, and I knew that I was going to get the guy that killed you, so... I mean, I got to get rid of t- two of y'all today, real easy, and make That's you right. pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to just say this here. I just want to end with this. Is, uh, you're so right about individually with your code because I think we just need to look at each, each one of us as an individual universe within ourselves and take on our code as an individual 
And um, I think that's going to be some of the problem solving, you know. Just that's what I've been saying all down through the years, and I hope that it catches on. I, I hope that people understand it because we are not trained by the white supremacists, and they're not going to to be a universe within ourselves as individuals because they know that any time we try to get what we call a group together, oh, that's tailor-made for them. <laughs> they can bust that up in five minutes, all right? All you need is a, a two or three black people to get together and call themselves anything. Put a label on it, and so that already you have separated yourself from all the other black people just by doing that. They already know that. So they know the science of how people think, okay? They're good at it. Okay, because they have been through all of this among themselves. They have run tests on these things among themselves. White people kill each other running tests. They're the, they're, they know more about murder than anybody. They know about manipulating people than anybody, the white supremacists, that is. So, therefore, they will say that, hey, you know, if you're going to get a little group together to fight me, I'll, I'll help you build a group. At a certain point, I'll wait until and see if you can got halfway got it together. Then I'll examine how your group operates. Then I will compromise your group either by sealing it off from the rest of the people because you've halfway done the job for me just by having that label. All right. I mean, you know, the black people will look at another uh, look at black people who are in a group who have formed a group, and the white supremacists already know that we're going to attack that group. Why don't they do something? They ain't solving my problems. I ain't joining them. All right. See, so the white supremacists know they got the vision right there. And that's solid, too. That group ain't going nowhere. But it's one thing, just like you just said, because that's the theory I have that has yet to be proven, by the way. That's why I say it's a concept. That if you empower each individual person with a code of behavior, you will solve the problems of each individual person with that code of behavior. And there's absolutely no defense against it. That's my, that's not my, my concept. That's the concept that comes with the universe. If you that's empower right. each individual to solve his or her problems according to a code, you have empowered and solved the problems of all individual persons. And the white supremacists, when they come after everybody, they don't know who to pick to start with because they're going to have to get everybody. And that's the position you want to put them in, the position of we got to either do justice for the non-white people, for the really all the people of this entire planet, or we're going to have to kill all of these non-white people. We're going to have to kill them all. all. Right. Of course, they got to call right there. We, we, and then, Neely Fuller, Jim. And Jimmy, I thank you for your call. We've got to take a quick break. We'll talk about that some more when we get back. Folks, you too can join the discussion with Neely Fuller, Jr. Reach out to us. Our number is 800 450 7876. We'll take your phone calls after this traffic and weather update on FM 95.9 and AM 1450. WOL, where information is power. Sanders, folks, I guess he's nearly full of Junior. You've got to listen very keenly because what he talks about, he uses his logic, cause and effect, he's explaining how racism, white supremacy works. If I'm, I want to take uh, advantage of, of what uh, our last caller, Jimmy out of Houston, said. He talked about us coming together, nearly full of Junior. Can you explain to us why it seems like it, that seems like an unattainable e- e- effort to come together? It seems like one, whenever we try to get on one page, there's always one or two of us are going to sell us out, or, the, or we all start attacking each other. I don't like the color of his shoes. I don't like the color of his shirt. I don't like it because he's got an accent. I don't like him because he's, he's from a different part of the world. How do we get beyond that? You don't get beyond it. What you do is absorb it. <laughs> That's the compensatory way. That's why I call it the compensatory counter racist code. Uh, see, I, I wrestle with that, okay? And then I said, oh, <laughs> It was right there all the time, but just like a lot of things, you don't see it. It's right there on the surface. You don't resist that. You don't push it away from you. You pull it to you. You say, just like I say, hey, don't cut Neely Fuller no slack. See, when people say, Neely Fuller, I don't agree with you. I said, you are doing exactly what you are supposed to do. Don't agree with me. Now, that leaves a vacuum. 
What do you agree with? He say, well, I agree with myself. I say, all right. By agreeing with yourself, you didn't agree with the statement that I made. What is your statement? See? That's what you call that absorption. See, that? I mean, and that's not a trick. That's scientific. Okay, if I reject, if there are ten things to choose from, and I reject nine of them, what does that leave me if there are only ten? That leaves me number ten. It ain't nowhere else to go but the number ten. That's all that the code is supposed to do when this subject comes up about black people getting together. No, you don't try to get black people together. You try to point black people toward what? One word, the truth. And say, now wrestle with it individually, yourself. What do you do about that truth that you are facing alone since you have painted yourself in that corner? All right. You say you got all the answers. Okay, this is answer time. All right. Okay, you're getting pulled over now. You say you didn't want to follow what you call Neely Fuller's formula, which is really not Neely Fuller's formula. It's the formula of the universe. I'm trying to get people to look into the laws of the universe. It's all around you. The universe teaches you cause and effect. Just like it taught me. I was hard headed. You're talking about, you know, I'm the universe. I'm not the universe. I better go along with the laws of the universe. I'm 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 kaput. I'm through. I'm finished. But see, black people, you know, we, we think we got some mysterious formula out of coming out of nowhere. I mean, you know, that you know, that just all about us and you know, and all the people call, and it's understandable because we have seen so many things fail. So we just assume that everything is a failure. Well, the universe hasn't failed, all right? So if you tap into the laws of the universe, you got it all, regardless of what Neely Fuller or anybody else says, because Neely Fuller had better tap into it, or he's in bigger trouble than he's already in now. So let's just give the illustration. There are people who have said, no, I can't be given over to the man, you know, when he comes around. When he pulls me over, I mean, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, you, know, I'm, I, you know, I ain't going to do that stuff that you say do because I just made suggestions. I said three things. I'm just giving one illustration because most black people don't pay any attention to it. Why? Neither full of sentence. That's why. If somebody else says it, if a white person says it, now they'll pay some attention to it. But I understand that. Why? Because that's one of the effects of white supremacy. A white person can come along and say the same thing Neely Fuller's been saying, and some of them have done it, all right? And, man, they get attention right quick, and I understand that, and that's okay with me because it really won't work for white supremacy if they're saying the same thing I'm saying, all right? It, It took some years for some white people to start using the term white supremacy, and people were telling me, Fuller, you know, you using this term white supremacy, ain't nobody doing that but you. I said, I'm going to keep at it because that's a formula. And that's the truth. See what I mean? It's not just a formula that I dreamed up. It's the truth. So now you have white people doing it, some white people, not most, but they'll use that term now in 2018. And uh, But I originally got it from them, okay, but they stopped using it. And they start going around saying white supremacy doesn't exist. And then black people, particularly a lot of intellectuals, pick that up and start saying, yeah, you know, why? Because Professor so-and-so who is white said so. Because that's where he gets his authorization, from Professor so-and-so. Now, black professors, if you notice, a lot of them argue with each other. But when a white person speaks, even if that white person ain't a professor, They kind of sit up and even if they don't say nothing, they take notice. They pay attention. But it's logical that they would because that's white supremacy at work. Because the white supremacists are the most successful people on the planet. All right. In recorded history, in all of recorded history. So in answer to where now got to watch Neely Fuller, too. See, I got away from the question. What was that question? The question is uh, us coming together. It seems like there's oh, always... Yeah, uh, coming together. Yeah. Come, that's right. a slogan. 
See, we got all kinds of slogans. We don't have a code. You know, Black Lives Matter. Well, Black Lives Matter to who? To whom? Black Lives Matter to people that don't matter, according to the evidence. That's why we keep getting pulled over and we keep going according to the ghetto code, which is a failure. I want to say that. Not only ghetto failure, culture is a failure, black culture, what we call genuine, you know, the real thing, black culture is a failure so far. Why? Because it hasn't solved problems. That's why. We shouldn't just put a label on something and say, no, we we got it. We got it all now. I mean, you know, and then add a footnote up under that box. We just put everything in and say, what? But we got a long way to go. Well, if you've got a long way to go, it means your culture is failing until you have done it all. And you better get there quick and and stop passing it on from generation to generation. So getting to this black black people getting together thing, no, you don't get together with black people. You don't do that. Black people standing shoulder to shoulder, looking up at a balcony somewhere. I mean, whomever's supposed to be up there that they're making a protest to or whatnot, that is really not power. Power is when you have a code. The white supremacists understand that. That's why just one or two white supremacists can show up anywhere on the planet. And with the white code, that's all they came with. And what is a code? Things that you do, things that you don't do. Things that you say, things that you don't say. That's all a code is when it comes to people. You have fire codes, electrical codes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But anything that works is a code if it works, meaning when you do it, it's going to work. Like I told people, a part of the code, as an illustration, I started to say this a while ago, have three Fs, adopt that as your code when you get pulled over by a racist suspect in the form of what you call a pretended police officer. Because police officers do not violate laws. Race soldiers do. But they pretend to be police officers. That Race soldiers is a term I made up so that we don't get police officers confused with race soldiers. That's two different things all together, a whole different world all together. So when you get pulled over by a suspected race soldier, go into the three Fs. Don't fuss, don't fight, don't flee. But people out somewhere out here right now are doing just that. They're fussing. They're jumping out with all this MF, MF this, and MF. We think that 15 MFs will take care of it. Not 2,000 MFs will take care of that situation, sir. Based on what? What Neely Fuller is saying? No, based on evidence. It's never worked. You can't point to a situation where it worked. You can't give il- any illustration in any so-called hood where you jumping out and doing all that mouth about what you don't like, about the way the world is run, to that person with that gun and badge, and you think that all of that cursing and whatnot is going to get you what you want, I say keep trying it. But I say you'll do better if you don't fuss, you don't fight, and you don't flee. Why? Because the evidence shows a very simple thing, a universal thing. It doesn't work. Why keep doing something that doesn't work? Why do? Why try? Why not try something that might work? Now that's not a guarantee, because you've got to figure where you are. The system of white supremacy is a prison system, and we are already prisoners of war. If you're a person of color, they're not trying to round you up and put you into captivity. You were captive before you were born in 2018. Any person of color on this planet right now who's being born right this minute is born under the system of white supremacy. So you're already in prison. When they put us in what we call a jail cell or a penitentiary, according to the code, that's what the code calls greater confinement. You're already confined. You're confined economically, educationally, the whole nine areas of activity, you're confined. Confined by whom? 
by the white supremacists. They tell you what you can do and what you better not do in all those areas of activity. Name one that they don't. That's why that coming together, that's just a bunch of black people on a slave ship. They came together. Right. Hold that thought right there again. Okay. We're going to take another short break. I'll let you finish. We've got, we've got some folks who want to speak to you. You too can join the discussion. We're nearly full of you. Want to reach out to us at 800-450-7876. We'll take your calls next on FM 95.9 and AM 1450. WOL, where information is power. So stand with us, folks. Our guest is Neely Fuller, Jr. The number to call to speak to Neely is 800-450-7876. Let me just say this again. You've got to listen really keenly to this discussion. You know, it's just not one of these conversations you can listen to one year. You've got to have two of your ears just stuck right into the speaker because you'll miss it because he uses logic, cause and effect. Some people don't get it. And most people who don't get it, they they... They, they, they just don't get it. They some re- refuse to get it. They, they don't understand what he's saying about racism and white supremacy. So before I take another call, and if you're on hold, we will get to you. Neely Fuller Jr., I'm going to let you finish your thought. Yes. Uh, I just gave, gave that illustration. But the, the core question was coming together. See, that's just another slogan. What does that mean? Come together and do what? We never get into the details. See, and we got to stop that. We need to stop that as of right now, this minute. Details mean everything. Okay, we all together. You know, what do we mean? We're, we're really thinking that if you look up and see another black person coming down the street and stands right next to you and high fives and do a, a bro sign or something like that, and then another one comes. And then another one comes, and then another one comes, and finally you got a whole bunch of black people standing shoulder to shoulder. All right. Now, that's very impressive if you're just, you know, going by numbers of black people. But you got numbers of black people all over the planet 24 7. So when we call coming together, that's what we mean. All the black people on the planet come together and stand shoulder to shoulder you know, and grin at each other and maybe even say how much we love each other because we love to use that word love when there's absolutely not an ounce of it among millions of us, okay? Not one ounce, truth be told, because you can't have love without justice no way. So forget that, all right? Now, according to what? According to logic, that's what, because love and justice are the same thing, all right? You can have love without justice. It doesn't compute. The laws of logic say that it doesn't compute. So that hurts a lot of people's feelings, but our feelings need to be hurt. All right, haven't been hurt enough for us to do what we need to do about it. But let's talk about this come together. So we're together. We were together on the slave ship, which we still are, because the whole world is a slave ship now, and we are on it. Okay? So, hey, coming together on a slave ship, what does that mean? Just a whole bunch of slaves in the prison yard, you might say, like prisoners. A lot of us have been in what we call greater confinement, called jails. So if everybody in the jail gets together in the prison yard, what does that mean? That means a whole lot of prisoners have gotten together in the prison yard. And the people that's running the prison, they don't care. I mean, you know, they're all standing down there shoulder to shoulder on their break, their prison break, that hour that we give them. So let them stand shoulder to shoulder. They're still in my prison. So they stand there and they sing and they feel better. And then they go back to their cells. And they think that that's power. Now we are ignorant, really, if we think that that is effective, because it's not. It looks like it is. But when you empower the individual, so that the individual person, like Andy the Frame in the movie Shawshank Redemption, he, he knew he was a majority of one. That's what you want to make each and every black person, a person of color on the planet, a majority of one. You don't look over your shoulder to see if you got any help at all. You say, I am going to work according to a code. There's certain things I'm going to do. And there's certain things I'm not going to do in each area of activity. And there's certain things I'm going to say 
And there's certain things I'm not going to say each and every day that I'm on this planet from now on. And you will adopt that code based on what? What works. Now, how do you find out what works? Trial and error. See, Neely Fuller can't tell you. But you just try things, and you pick out the best thing that can possibly be done in any circumstance that you find yourself in, on a job, when you're being pulled over by a suspected race soldier, when you're just having a conversation with somebody on a bus. You say certain things, and you don't say certain things. You should codify all of that. Certain words you use, certain words you never use, all right? That's what we need. Why? Because the white supremacists have exactly that. And I started to say just a few minutes ago, that's why all over the world, down through the history of white supremacy, two or three, not a whole army, but two or three white supremacists can show up among a bunch of what you might call unsuspected and native peoples and have them eaten out of their hand. They showed up at 5 o'clock, and by 7 o'clock, those people are doing everything that those people, those two or three white people showed up and having them do. Why? Because the white supremacists have a code, the most powerful code in the world, which is what? The white code, which is what? We don't do nothing that don't make us powerful. We don't make a move that makes us weaker than we already are. And when we make a mistake, and they do, we correct it immediately. We don't go back and do that same thing. That's something black people do. And they'll call it their culture because they've been doing it for a thousand years. That's why they've been failing for a thousand years, too. See, culture is nothing but what you are doing that works. That's the only thing that should be anybody's culture. Does it work? Well, we clap our hands and we sing. All right. So what does that do? Well, it makes me feel better. It makes you feel better in prison? Yeah. Okay. So I'm not going to knock that. I believe in singing. Okay. I, You know, I try to sing to myself sometimes. I certainly listen to what you call sounds. But all sounds that black people are making in this day and time, according to the code, should help you to think, speak, and act in a constructive manner. Otherwise, we should say that ain't music, that's noise. See, now this is in the textbook for victims. See, talking to, see, I, I try to get to the part where what to do about things rather than just keep going around in a circle talking about how awful everything is. No. Music to a black person. See, music is nothing but a sound. Because there's two types of sounds in the universe. I'm talking about universal logic now. Just two. Music and noise. Now, what's the difference between music and noise? Music is whatever you think about doing when you hear that sound, whatever that sound is. The sound of a waterfall. The the sound of uh, a chair falling over. The sound of someone knocking on the door. What do you think? And the difference between sounds is music and noise. Is that music? Sometimes we use a slang expression. That's music to my ears. What? I don't hear no music. That's what the other person says. Say, hey, you hear that knock on the door? That's my cousin. He's just bringing me $4,000. He said he'd be over today. At noon, and it's noon, and he's here with the $4,000. That's music to my ears, that knock on the door. You didn't know it until I told you. Because sound means nothing until you make it mean something. Music means nothing until you make it mean something. And noise means something until you say that it's noise. And you should distinguish between music and noise and make it sure that if you hear a sound, it's always music, meaning something that's going to work for you in a constructive manner. Every sound you hear, whether it's a person saying something to you or a knock on a door, suppose you have your universe tailored that way so that every sound that you embrace helps you to think, speak, and act in a better manner than you did before you heard that sound. And when you sit down to write a song, 
you know, a lot of us like to write songs. We like to be songwriters and whatnot. I mean, ad infinitum. Ask yourself, when I play this, is it going to have a constructive effect on the people who are listening to it? Or is it going to have a non-constructive effect? Is it going to be music or is it going to be noise? Because there's no such thing as in between. It's either going to be music or noise if they embrace it, if they're listening to it at all. And what can be music right now, and everybody knows this, can be noise later on. Depends on the environment. Depends on what's going on. See? You're sitting with your feet up, and you're listening to what? Music. And you are inspired to do great things, all right, to do constructive things. Okay? But that same sound, playing that same record, you will call it noise. Two hours later, if you're a surgeon, and you're in that surgery room, and all of a sudden that comes blasting over the loudspeaker. Stop and think about it. I'm talking about logic now. I'm talking about the real world. All right, that the white supremacist seals us off from by giving us all types of what? False things to go chasing after, like the illustration I just gave, like a symbol on a pair of shoes, and somebody's got to die for it. That is a terrible thing to do with a person's mind. But the white supremacists do it with a smile on their face and think nothing of it and say, these dumb Negroes, we got them forever. They don't know what's valuable, and they don't know what isn't valuable, except what I tell them, and that's what I am going to do, keep them that way. In All right, hold that thought right there. we got to take a quick break here. we got some folks who want to speak to you. 800-450-7876. Get you Neely Fuller, Jr. We'll take your calls next on FM 95.9 and AM 1450. W-O-L. Where information is power. And thanks for staying with us, folks. Our guest is Neely Fuller Jr. We're talking about racism, white supremacy, and, and he says, if you don't understand it and all and how it works and everything else that you think you understand, it'll only serve to confuse you. It's a matrix. Before we get back to Neely, though, let me tell you, uh, coming up next few days, you're going to hear from Dr. B, a metaphysician, and also some of the uh, some of the old-timers, the baseball old-timers are in town, so they may join us as well. I know Willie Randolph is here, and also uh, Dave Winfield is here, so, so they may call in as well. So tell your friends to keep it locked on FM 95.9, AM 1450, WOL. Let's go to our callers who want to speak to Neely Fuller Jr. P-Dub's calling from California. is on line one. P-Dub, you're on with Neely Fuller Jr. Yes, uh, thank you, Carl, for taking my call. Can you hear me okay, first of all? Sure. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, Dr. Feely, I really enjoy uh, Fuller. I really enjoy listening to you, as a lot of Carl's the listeners do, because uh, we're all seeking the truth here, and you get us a little closer. My question today is uh, religion. You know, it's a hard subject, especially with our culture. We hold on to it like it's the holy grail and it's everything. Since I've been listening to Carl's show, I've been born. I mean, I have always been in Christianity. My doc, my uh, father was a minister. But now I hold my uh, Christianity in question. I'm looking for a higher level of spirituality. But our people, I can't even talk to them about this. They even question somebody about the Bible. They get angry, you know, like, oh, God. But I said, white supremacy, there's been a thousand men have rewritten the Bible. So why do we believe in that verbatim by faith and we're not sure? You can't back up anything. All these different hands that have written the Bible. How do you get past that? That's why we have so many in our culture that... You know, if you don't believe in the Bible, I ain't got time to talk to you. It's, it's okay. The seventh area of activity in the textbook for victims of white supremacy is the area of religion. Very powerful force. So how do you handle discussions about religion? That's the question. All problems are solved through the process of questions and answers. That's a part of the, the codified mantra, you might say. All problems, no exceptions. So you go into the question mode. So you say, well, when you talk about religion, what you usually get, what, is an endless argument. I have sat in barbershops like forever. 
And those arguments about the Bible uh, and Christianity and whatnot are endless. I mean, you can leave that barber shop with your hair cut or with your braids or whatever you do, and you can come back seven years later if those same people are sitting in there. They'll be having the same argument they had when you left. Now, a lot of people can testify to that truth, all right? I mean, nothing is ever resolved. It just goes on and on and on and on. Yeah, but Solomon said this, and I know my Bible, and blah, 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 blah. And the other person said, oh, man, you know, I got, you know, I mean, you know, uh, I used to preach myself. So I know you ain't talking about that. I mean, you know, because it says in uh, uh, Chronicles, man, uh, so and so and so and so. So what about that? And you know, and it just goes on and on and on and on and on. So it comes down to one question. What do you do about that? And what do you do about it when people actually start hitting each other over the head with the Bible? I mean, I mean, sometimes it really gets out of hand. You know, and you have what you call religious wars where people start taking out swords. Or well, if you don't believe it, I mean, I'll show you. Okay? <laughs> Now you got something that you didn't have when you started talking in the first place. So what do you do? According to the code, what I've written is just three simple things, and I don't deviate from them. You ask questions, just three questions. What is the name of your religion, sir or ma'am? Question number one, because most religions have names. Number two. What does your religion require you to do in all nine areas of activity? And then you list them. Economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. So you're asking questions now, and do not help the person with the answer. You're asking questions. You already know what you think. That's not what you're doing. You want to know what they are about and what to do about what they are about and how to interact with this person if you're going to interact with them at all. This is the recommended compensatory counter-racist formula that I say. Those three things. Uh, Name two. Number three. What does your religion require you to do when you interact with me? Now, I'll go over them again right briefly. What is the name of your religion? What does your religion require you to do in all nine areas of activity? All right. And what does your religion require you to do in all of those nine areas of activity when you interact with me as a person, as an individual person? Because all religions, for the most part, have requirements. And that's all you should need to know. And don't argue about anything else other than that. If the person starts telling you about what holy book they use and all like that, you'll say, well, that's a part of your religion, so that's your business. All right? I ain't going to argue with you about none of it. Don't ever get into a Bible argument with anybody. Just ask them those three questions. Because ultimately, that's all that's going to count anyway. If you stop and think about it scientifically. The only thing that's really going to count after you all talk and argue for 40,000 years about what the Bible means and what this chapter means and and what David did, uh, you know, and what the woman at the well was wearing and, you know, and whether or not she had a turban on her head. I mean, you know, you can go on and on and on about that. Okay. No. What is the name of your religion? What does your religion require you to do? And what does your religion, this is your religion now, sir or ma'am, require you to do when you interact with me? So I'll know what to expect when I see you coming. You know, mm-hmm. I'll, what I know when, whether to, you know, go toward you or away from you. Because your religion might require you to do me harm. So when I see you coming down the road, and since you told me, yeah, when I see people like you, you're a non-believer. I'm supposed to. I'm supposed. I'm supposed to. You know, go after you, and whoop you into believing. Well, I don't want to take no whipping, so I start running. That's all. <laughs> mm, 
I mean, you know, I mean that. But if everybody on the planet just does that, we'll have a real quick understanding of religion and what religion is supposed to produce. Okay. Well, most most people base their codes are based on their religion. And, uh, That's okay. You know, All you want to know is what does it require them to do when they interact with you? That's the clincher question. See, those right. first those first two questions are just the preparatory questions. What's the name of your religion? Doesn't mean it'll make no difference what the name of a person's religion is. It really doesn't. All right. What you really want to know is what you're going to do. See? You know, it's all, you know, people, religions are full, full of rhetoric. All religions are full of words, man, words like you wouldn't believe. They go on and on and on. But at the end, at the beginning and the end of each day, scientifically, in this universe, the only thing that really matters is what a person does, not what they say. All right? Saying leads up to the doing. All right? See, saying always leads up to somebody doing something. What you want to do is clinch what they're going to do. And if the person says, oh, my religion requires, when I come in contact with a person like you, my religion requires you to convert you to my religion. Now you know. Yeah, All right? I think so. Okay. Well, or say, so let them talk. And when they finish, say thank you very much. And then when you hear the other person down the road say the same thing, my religion requires me to convert you to my religion. You listen to them, okay? But if their religion says, my religion requires me to convert you to my religion, or else I'm going to come around tonight and burn your house down, now what you do is get some fire extinguishers and maybe a gun and maybe whatever help you can get if you don't want your house burned down. Because the person has told you what they're going to do now, all right? Well, it's a little it's a little deeper than that for me because it's uh, my household is my wife. Oh, okay, it's, it's, a, it's a question Christianity. You know. All right, do. now <laughs> let's walk through it. See, codification is about details, all of it. Now, what does she do when she talks about religion? She's I mean, what does she what does she say when you, if you ask her these three questions? She says, "Just believe." Well, you're my wife, but what is your religion? As my wife. And let her tell you. Don't interfere with it. And then say, well, what does your religion require you to do as my wife? Convert and then me. last but not least, what does your religion require you to do about me here in this house with you? What does your religion require you to do about me? Because ultimately, that's all you want to know anyway. What is she going to do well, about like you? you? Said, well, like you said, most of them want to convert you. Okay, convert me by doing what? Okay, now now you really get into the question mode. We convert me into doing what that I'm not already doing. Believe in the Bible by faith. Okay, Absolutely. all right. Okay, believe in what in the Bible? See, all you got to do is just keep asking questions. It'll, the answers will take you right where you need to go in record time, but don't interfere with the answers. So you know, I've been through all of this. Okay, all of it. So I know where it's going. Okay, that's why I wrote what I wrote. And, and you know, and, and usually it's a short conversation. Those people say, well, you believe in Jesus Christ. If they're talking about Christianity, I say, okay, right. believe in Jesus, Jesus Christ doing what? Believe in Jesus Christ being your Savior. I say, okay, so I believe that somebody came come to save me from my evil doings. I don't have no problem with that. Is that what this is all about? I ain't got no problem with that. Somebody going to save me from my evil doings? I got no problem with that. Now, next problem. Mm. Well, yeah, that's all you got to do is just keep asking questions. And that's going to be a short conversation. If you don't believe it, try it. And that will be resolved. This thing that you're saying has been dragging on, because it drags on with millions of people. You can stop this from dragging on. Because all they got to do is just tell you, you know, because every Christian I ever talked to has said, just believe on Jesus, and that's it. I say, that's it? And I say, yeah. I, why Why should I deny that? Why should I deny somebody coming 2,000 years ago to save me here in 2018 for whatever sins I am, in, you know, have put out there and assuming that I have done some? 
I ain't going to argue with that. That doesn't call for an argument because no, everything doesn't. has been said. Hey, and if I believe I that, just... okay, so I don't have no problem believing that because that could be true. And so why well, did I, why would I reject it? Somebody coming to do anything for me, even if it ain't true, just a report that somebody came to help me. I said, I ain't got no problem with that at all because I need help. <laughs> all right, you know, hey, <laughs> dump all the help that you possibly can get. Yeah. Dump it on me full time. All right. So let's go on to the next problem. Is it another problem in this house? All right. Because we have settled that one. Right. Well, I was sharing something I heard on the Carl Nelson show with her about uh, one of the speakers were saying. Actually, hang on a second, P-Dub. We're going to take a short break here as we're closing on the top of the hour so some of our stations can identify themselves. I'll let you pose your question to Neely Fuller on the other side right here on FM 95.9 and AM 1450. W-O-L, where information is power. Thank you for staying with us, folks. Or if you're just getting off work, uh, it's uh, on a minute after six on the East Coast. Our guest is Neely Fuller Jr. Uh, if you've listened long enough, you've heard him, and you've heard Dr. Wilson mention him quite a bit. Uh, Dr. Wilson says that was uh, her mentor. And the number to call to speak to him is 800 450 7876. Before we left for the top of the hour break, we're speaking with P Dub, calling from California. And P Dub, uh, he went through that exercise with you, which I thought was fascinating. But you have a follow up question, so I'm going to let you pose your follow up question to Neely Fuller Jr. Yeah, that is pretty much it is, um, like I said, I was having a conversation with my wife about something I heard on your show about God having chosen people, but I was trying to tell her my argument, like Dr. Foley says, you just ask questions. I said, these days, it's like people throw a Bible in a blender and all these other truths, and they blend it all up, and that's the new Kool-Aid. Drink it and, and run by it with faith. Just have faith that it's going to come out right. And uh, me, myself, I'm receptive. I am in the pursuit of the knowledge of truth. And that's hard to find these days because everything, they're just mixing the truth up with everything, and you can't find it anymore. All right. Well, thank you for your comment, Pete Up. Go ahead, Neely Fuller. Yeah, there's a formula for finding truth. Truth is nothing but that which is. So all you have to do is just ask questions. That's how you find out the truth about anything. I mean, all problems. I don't care what kind of problem it is. It's been proven. This is not nearly full of talking. This is this is pure logic. This is pure science that came with the creator of the universe. Put this in the universe. It's called questions and answers. I didn't invent it. That's all you have to do. That's how every problem that's ever been solved has been going to the moon was solved through the process of questions and answers. Somebody asked a question, maybe 10 million years ago. What in the world is that? That thing that's up there. You know, what is that? I mean, what does it do? I mean, you know, what what is it? What is it? Okay. Sometimes it seems like it's far away. Sometimes it seems like it's up close. Sometimes it seems like it's so up close you can reach out and touch it. Okay. And other times... It seems like it moves around. What is it? And then somebody says, I don't know. Is this something? You know, let's call it a moon. I mean, you know, well, what is a moon? I don't know. It's just, we call it a moon. All right. It gives off a little bit of light at night sometimes. Sometimes it doesn't. Okay. So somebody else, a thousand or two million years later, said, You think we can get there? So somebody probably tried to get there. They probably tried to put up some type of kite or something, thought that it would get there. Or they could climb a mountain, like I saw in a cartoon, people climbing a mountain thinking that if they got to the top of the mountain, they could reach out and grab the moon because it looks like the moon was right behind the mountain. You know, they even wrote songs about it. But they went there and they found out that didn't work. So, but eventually somebody kept asking questions. I think there might be a way to get there. And we ask enough questions about how we can probably get there and find out really what it's like, okay, by being there. And when a man named John Kennedy suggested it, it sounded like a lunatic idea. Because for millions of years, it sounded like a lunatic idea. All right? They say, you know, he wrote songs saying, reaching for the moon, which is an old saying. Be careful what you say can't be done, 
because some damn fool will come along and do it. Okay, so let's get back to racism. A lot of people say that racism, there ain't nothing you can do about it. But the compensatory counter-racist concept, based on this thing about questions and answers, say that anything that people put together, and racism is put together by people, by the way, can be taken apart by people. It's just a matter of figuring out how it's put together. And how do you figure out how anything is put together, including religious discussions? How are they put together? They're put together by questions and answers. Okay? That's how religions are formed. Uh, I understand that the persons they call Jesus, from what some preachers have told me, had a question when he left here. Uh, when there were plenty of witnesses around other than the lady who came and found that the rock had been rolled away, uh, uh, if I remember the story correctly. But while he was being led to be put on that cross, he had a question. And I think, if I recall correctly what the preachers say, I don't know, I wasn't there. But if I recall correctly, and people can correct me if I'm in error, the last thing he did was ask a question. My God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, there might be some scholars who will say, no, that wasn't his last, you know, that wasn't his last words. His last words, he asked for water, you know. Uh, you know, so here we got another circle again. That's why you have a different church on every corner, by the way. Because some preacher disagreed with some other preacher about what it meant by something that was said by Ezekiel. And so he went off and got his own church and told everybody else, don't y'all go down there because them people don't know what they're doing. Okay. And then some people have even had wars about it. There, you know, and after all, if you're talking about Christianity, now right now, Islam is on the front burner. But we have had so-called Christian wars. They had what they call King Richard and his crusades. Crusade comes from the word cross. Them people over there don't believe what I believe. They don't interpret the Bible like I believed it. So I'm going to go over there and show them. Well, how are you going to do that, Richard? I'll show them by the sword. They'll believe it after I get through putting this whooping on them. And so they had something called the crusades. Crusades meaning... We're carrying a cross over there, but we are carrying it in the form of a sword. So people have thought about religion. Black people don't want to get into that no more. Don't fight not one thing about religion. Man, no, absolutely, except one. Like I put it in my textbook, I'm against one religion for sure, and that's the religion of white supremacy, which I say is the strongest religion on the planet right now as we speak. There's no religion stronger than the religion of white supremacy. By what, Paul? By definition. Definition of what? Definition of religion. A strong belief backed up by action. Now, the white supremacists are the only people that I know of who have a religion that practice every bit of it. They don't cut corners nowhere. Man, when they practice white supremacy, they practice it. And they practice it 24-7. They don't let up. They don't skip over any part of their religion. Whereas the people that I have been around in my existence, sometimes I will question them. Go to that question again. I'll say, I thought you told me your religion requires you to do such and such a thing. Well, you know how it is, you know. I mean, we all have lapses. Oh, well, this lapse seemed to have lasted a long time. Why is that? Oh, well, you know, that's just a side. Well, that's something I decided that I was going to make an exception to. Oh, you're going to make an exception to your religion. You told me this, your, your religion required you to do this and this and this. Now you, out of those three things or four things or ten things that you mentioned, you made an exception to one or two of them because you found it to be what? Did you find it to be convenient? See, I'm going to ask that question. Well, yeah, because, you know, pressure was on me. So 
I had to tell the people, you know, well, yeah, I, 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 I'll go along with what they say on this one because, you know, uh, so I, I, I did, you know, I had to throw that part of my religion out the window, I mean, for at least a couple of years. Oh, so then you didn't have your religion. You didn't practice your religion. Well, you know, uh, no, 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 well, uh, no, you can say that. Well, I just said it. I'm asking a question. Did you or didn't you? Well, I didn't. Okay, all right. But you said that's your religion. Well, now, get back to the point that I'm making. The white supremacists don't do that. Because the name of their religion is not Christianity, Islam, Buddhism. They'll say that. Judaism? No. A white supremacist will say that they are anything. Republican, Democrat, communist, capitalist. They'll say anything. But they believe in and practice one thing. White supremacy. That's it. That's all they believe in, and nothing else. All right. 800-450-7876. Michael's joining us uh, on line three, calling from Chicago. Michael, you have a question or a comment for Neely Fuller? Yes. How are both of you this afternoon? Hello? You're learning. Okay, great, great. Listen, um, I wanted to just uh, uh, ask you a question regarding something you said earlier about us getting together. And ironically, after you spoke on that, you had a commercial with Al Sharpton talking about us getting together. I think that when he says that, I think he he's talking about maybe two, three million of us all going to Washington, D.C. and spending a couple of hundred dollars with the white supremacists because that's the only way you can get there by bus, plane, train, motel, hotel. We own none of that stuff. So, you know, we give them a hundred million dollars to show them our dissatisfaction with them. Does your analogy also apply to those getting togethers that people like him like to have? I can't speak against that because the code does not allow me to. See, that's a part of the code. That's VGQ. Everybody. So so in other words, what he's doing is okay. What he's doing is nothing that I can disapprove of for a very simple reason. I'm not qualified. See, no victim of racism has the correct qualifications to criticize another victims of racism method of fighting racism. Why? Based on logic. Based on logic. Let me finish. Uh, Hang on a second, Michael. Let him finish. Go ahead. Go ahead. He's saying I'm quiet. Uh, Say that again. No, he told me to be quiet. I'm I'm listening to you then. I just want to respond when you finish. Oh, no. Well, see, no, I'm not qualified. See, in fact, a lot of black people love to do things or like to do things that they know that other black people will criticize. All right? That way they can just keep a good argument going. That's why religion works so well among black people, because we can just argue, 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 argue about the Bible. That way we don't have to pay attention to nothing else, all right? I mean, that's, that's, that's like, you know, hey, if you can get an argument about the Bible, it keeps you from one thing. Usually people don't get in fights about the Bible, and it's a good way to communicate and spend the evening. And so it's all. Right. Hang like on a it. second, Neely Fuller. We got to take a quick break. Stay with us, Michael, because uh, you guys are having a great discussion right here. 800 450 7876. You too can join the uh, conversation. Reach out to us. We're on FM 95.9 and AM 1450. WOL, where information is power. We're staying with us, folks. Hey, it's not too late to call a couple of your friends and tell them to listen in because this is a very important question that Michael posed. Uh, basically, what we do with our sellouts, 800-450-7876, number to call to get in, and I'm glad he posed that question because it always comes up in some variation or other. So, uh, Neely Fuller Jr., I'll let you finish your response to Michael. And, Michael, I know you're going to have a, you're going to have a follow-up as well. The main thing is don't. You know, I I have a a codified response, rather, when people ask me about an individual person or a group of persons who are supposedly or genuinely fighting racism, all right? And it's a code requirement. I simply say, if you're talking about a male black person, for instance, like I have been asked from time to time, who said something, about race or racism, 
my response according to the code. And that's why I'm saying I don't even have to think about it. That's that's the magic of a code, you might say, if you want to use the word magic. You don't have to do last-minute thinking. You don't have to do head-scratching. You just go straight to the code and say what the code says is the best thing to say or do. That's what a code is, the best thing to say or do. So I just simply say, if someone asks me about Reverend Sharpton or Martin Luther King or or anybody who is involved in trying to rid the world of racism, I just simply say, he said what he said. If the person said something, I just say the person said what he said, male or female or whatever. She said what she said. And if the person asked me, well, what do you think about what she said? I think about she said what she said. That's what. It, that's that's the end of that story. That's as far as I can go. That keeps me from doing what? Empty criticism, because the criticism I have found from experience doesn't work anyway. See, when you criticize people who are supposed to be black leaders and all like that, it doesn't go anywhere. I mean, it's just like prisoners walking around in the prison yard. I'm, I'm criticizing the other prisoners down there in cell block C. What does that mean? I'm just criticizing the people in cell block C. That doesn't have anything to do with us being in prison. I, You know, I disagree with, you know, the way they kiss up to the warden down there in cell block C. Okay? So I disagree with it. So what? We are all still prisoners when we go to bed at night and wake up in the morning. So therefore, it's a, you may, some people might say, well, that's just a roundabout way of saying no comment. And it is, in truth. And why is it that way? Because it doesn't work. That's why. See, codification is about doing nothing that doesn't work. And I found from experiment that doesn't work. I can talk and talk and talk and go on television programs and radio programs and talk about handkerchief head Negroes and all like that. And when I fall down exhausted after 10 years of it, not one thing changes. Why? Because the white supremacists may call the shots anyway. All right. <laughs> you know, all prisoners are equal. That's the first thing we have to keep in mind. When you're a prisoner of war, you are equal to every other prisoner. And all you do is just listen to what the other prisoner says about our predicament. That's all. They're speaking. You're listening. And then it comes your time to speak at, at, you know, at lunchtime or whenever you get together in the yard. And you say something. You talk about how you don't like the prison or how it's being run. And you don't like the way the other prisoners are acting and all like that. Okay, so everybody's just talking about what they don't like and what they do like. And that, you know, you prefer this warden to the one that you had the last time and all like that. So then you go back to your respective sales. So what? So why argue? Why start an argument about everybody's points of view when all the prisoners in there are CO prisoners? You just fall down exhausted from all your arguments, but nothing has changed. But what does change is when. The white supremacists are affected. And that's when you sit up and take notice. See, we watch each other like hawks. Black people, even walking down the street, you don't pay any attention to white people at all. It's like they're not even there. We just kind of glance at them, I mean, make sure we don't bump into them or something like that. You know, but generally, they're invisible. They're invisible to us. We are not invisible to them. But generally speaking, it kind of looks like they are. But they have already paid enough attention to us to have them, to have us under their thumb. So on a minute-by-minute basis, they don't look up and check out black people at all, white people. When they get on the subways and whatnot, they, you know, on a plane, they open a book or look at the iPads or something like that. There ain't no point in talking to you. They ain't going to learn nothing that they don't already know that's worth knowing. They already know that. See, you're not a good conversationalist, none of us, even when we think we're smart. I mean, what, whatever we know, we they know where we got it, okay, that's worth knowing. 
And they also know one thing for sure. We are prisoners of war. So if they're on the warden's staff, they can entertain themselves by sitting next to a prisoner. All right. One of the guards come down and sit down and talk to one of the prisoners. Well, that's just, you know, casual entertainment. But you're still a prisoner. And they are still on the warden's staff. So they just go back to what, doing what they're doing. Because why? It's advantageous in a prison to be on the warden's staff. And you are not a prisoner. You're on the staff of prison masters. You're not a prisoner of war. So, you know, a lot of black people say, well, white people don't like us. It's not a matter of liking. White supremacy is a business. It's a gangster business, like the Corleones. What did Santino in the movie The Godfather kept trying to tell young Michael? Michael, you're getting excited about being hit on the jaw. It wasn't personal. I mean, that lick on the jaw, I mean, it wasn't personal. It's business. They're just putting you in your place knowing what your place is in the structure. I mean, they don't have anything against you personally, but you're violating the laws of the structure. The laws, and in the broader sense of what we're talking about, white supremacy has laws. And so when that white person says something harsh on the job to a black person, it's not really personal. It's that, wait a minute, you're forgetting your status. You are in the system of white supremacy, fella. I mean, you're a nice guy, and I like you and all like that. Personally, if you just want to get personal, I really like you. I like you better, and I've had white people say that. I really like you better than I like a whole lot of white people. But it ain't about liking. You all think it's about who likes who. It ain't about who likes anybody. It's about taking care of business. And I am in the business master category. You happen to have been born in a category that's not a master category. Sorry about that. That's not my fault, buddy. That's not my fault. I can't help it if I was born white and a member of the royal family. You just ain't royal. And it ain't personal. I like you personally better than I like anybody in my family. But I got to do harm to you. Why? Because that's the white code, that's why. And I can't violate the white code, period. Now, they don't tell us that, but that's what that means. And that's what I mean by understanding white supremacy. When you understand that one principle, that's a gold mine of knowledge. And Neely Fuller didn't invent it. He had to have it knocked into his head. I mean, you know, not literally, but figuratively over a period of years. I finally got it. Right. And, and, and I'm going to interrupt because I hope a lot of people just got what you said. Michael, I know you have a follow-up. Yeah, I just want to say quickly that, you know, in terms of, and I know you use this word logic when you, when you talk about uh, Dr. Fuller there and that he employs logic. Shouldn't, is, is, is logic, I'm assuming, is something that's positive. There is no such thing as negative logic. I'm assuming that. Uh, so if you're using logic, to me, it's, if I say something like what I've said, I'm hoping that someone will hear that and that they will stop participating in things that are illogical, like marches, and take that energy and that money and put it somewhere where it'll do us some good. When I said I, I, I could care less about Al Sharpton, he's going to be who he is. There are many Al Sharpton. My aim is to have people think about what they're doing when they get involved in things like that, that really just take from us and give nothing back. Have a good day. All right. Well, uh, thanks, Michael. Going, thanks here again, question. that was his opinion, and I can't even argue with his opinion, because that's his opinion. But I can't do that. I cannot criticize any non-white persons based on logic. Now, based on logic, I am not qualified to criticize any fellow victims, because I'm a victim. It's not like I got out from under white supremacy. I'm under it. I'm under their grip. I'm just another uniformed prisoner in a prisoner of war camp. That's who I am. I don't forget that. So I can give my opinion, 
about another prisoner's ideas about hitting that fence tomorrow, you know, trying to climb over that barbed wire. Now, if he asked me or she, say, what do you think if I hit that barbed wire? I jump up and head for, head for that barbed wire right now. And I will say, well, I see a guard up there with a shotgun, and I see another guard over there in the other tower with a machine gun, and I see all that razor wire. And hold that thought right there, Neely Fuller Jr. We've got to take another break real quick, and uh, I'll let you finish your thought on the other side. And Fixico and Winston want to speak to you as well right here on FM 95.9 and AM 1450. WOL, where information is power. And thank you for staying with us. Uh, very dis- interesting discussion with Neely Fuller Jr. 800 7876 Winston's been holding for a while on line one. He's calling from the district. Winston, you have a question or a comment for Neely Fuller Jr.? Well, first I'm going to say uh, no one could make it as plain as Neely Fuller has laid his uh, diatribe out. I mean, it's, it's just plain and simple. But see, the problem is you can't put a 1,000 watts in a 50-watt bulb. Now, let, let me explain this to you. Because of what we eat and what we receive in our bodies and, and, and through our minds, we are under the auspices of the Lucifer consciousness. We come in the world in three stages of darkness, and we have been taught and culturally conditioned to believe in another kind of darkness, which is lies and deception, and, and, and people go oh, Right, but, but Winston, do us a favor, because we, we're racing the clown. We still got a bunch, bunch of folks who want to speak to him. So you have a question or a comment directly for Neely Fuller Jr.? Well, only thing I can say, you, you got a tough job, and uh, I hope you all the success that you can get I'm trying to convince our people to uh, conform to the reality of what's really going on, and, and, and that's it. All right. Thank thanks, you. Winston. 800-450-7876. Fixico's been holding for a while, too. He's on line two, calling from L.A. Fixico, your question or your comment for Neely Fuller, Jr.? Yes, Hotel Brother Carl and Professor Fuller. It's an honor. So 20 years ago, when I first began my activism, I was bombarded with the opinion from sincere blacks that black people aren't good at functioning as a group. I came to the conclusion that there must be an external reason why our most dependable success comes from individuals. My question to you since our most dependable success seems to come from individual effort, should we put emphasis on developing our in individuals or on our, our groups. Yes, I said earlier in the program, uh, what I have written in the textbook for victims of white supremacy is that, and that's why I call it the United Independent Compensatory Code System concept. It's just a concept, but I say it's the missing link. It's the one thing we haven't seriously tried, and that is to take to have a code that can be addressed to every individual person because everything in the universe is either going to be a plus or a minus. In other words, it's going to be constructive or non-constructive. So all we need to do is just find out everything to do and say that's going to have a constructive result and everything to do and say that's going to have a non-constructive result. That's all it is. It's just that simple. Doing and saying. Doing and saying. Constructive, non-constructive. Cause and effect. Fire will burn. Water is wet. I mean, you learn that and you act accordingly. How do you use fire? How do you not use fire? How do you use water? How do you not use water? How much water? When? Where? In order to do what? Cause and effect. These are the laws of the universe, which is what the white supremacists try to separate and have done a pretty good job, black people's minds from the laws of the universe. Now, in answer to the question, all we need to do is tap into that full force, cause and effect. What works, what doesn't work. That's how you know. You'll try something and you see, well, wait a minute, I tried this. And I tried this, and I tried this, and it doesn't work. But when I look over at the next person, and they are doing it a different way, 
and it works. So rather than just keep doing it the way that I'm doing it, why not look at what works for the person that it works for, that I'm standing right there looking at it and seeing that it works for them. That works for them. Then I can ask questions about that. Not just pay attention to what I'm doing is not working and trying to get better at working at something that doesn't work. Look and see if there's anybody who's done anything that does work, no matter how small it is or how large it is, and say, well, maybe if I try that, it might work for me. Now, you, it might be just tailored for that person. So when you try it, it doesn't work for you. It might be tailored just like, you know, clothes. What they're doing is just correct for them, all right? <laughs> but when you tried, it didn't work for you. So now you found that out. You tried it, and it didn't work. It's all about trial and error. Everything is, all right? But first make up your mind what it is you're trying to do in the first place, which is what black people have to get focused on. And there's four things in the code book that fits all situations, four questions. And I'm going to cite them right now. What do you want to do? Every creature wants to do something every minute of every day, except when you're asleep. Well, when you're asleep, your mind is not working, and so your mind is resting. So you don't really want to do anything in your sleep uh, for the most part. That's birds, bees, people, whatever, uh, lions, tigers, giraffes. Okay, but when you're awake, from the time you're awake, you want to do something. If you're in bed, you either want to keep lying there or you want to get up out of the bed. Now, once you get up out of the bed, you want to do something. So every creature wants something every minute of every day. There's no exceptions to that that rule. Okay, that's number one. What do you want to do when you're having a discussion with someone or it's turning into an argument? See, these four questions fit any situation. Immediately go to these four questions. What do you want to do, sir? Or if you're talking to somebody in your house, what do you want to do? That's question one. Question number two, why do you want to do it? And don't interfere with the answer. When the person is trying to answer the question, they might be struggling trying to answer the question. Don't try to intimidate the person or something like that. That's not what this is about. This is about finding out things and getting on the correct page. That's what it's about. That's where it's leading. What do you want to do? Question one. Question two. Why do you want to do it? People usually have reasons for wanting to do whatever they want to do. I want to catch the bus. You know, I want to change jobs. I want to go to Philadelphia. Okay, why do you want to go to Philadelphia? What do you want to do? I want to go to Philadelphia. Why do you want to go to Philadelphia? And let them tell you. Don't interfere with the answer. Don't argue about the answer. Okay? Question number three. How do you plan to do what you said you wanted to do? This is something you want to do. How do you plan to do it? Now, the person might say, I don't know. Well, that's the answer. But don't interfere with the answer. All right? And just move to the fourth question. Because it's not before. What do you expect the constructive result to be of what you said you wanted to do, and you said why you wanted to do it, and you said, you know, you didn't have a plan for what you're going to do, or you did say you had a plan. But the clincher question, the bottom line question, that's the right to the, you know, right to the juggler question, you might say. What do you expect the constructive result to be of what it is that you want to do? And then don't say anything else other than that. Just record in your mind what answers they gave you. And see if they will do what they want to do, because people usually will do what they want to do. Now, here's what. A lot of people say they want to do something, but they're not telling the truth. Because what they say they want to do, they really don't want to do it. They're just saying something. All right? People do that all day long. Yeah, what I want to do is this, that, and other. I'd like to go into business. That's what I want to do. All right? 
but you don't see them making any move to do, not not even the first move, to do that, what they say they want to do. So that person's just not telling the truth. So you can just ask questions about that. You don't ever tell them that they're not telling the truth. That starts an argument. You just simply say, I talked to you about six months ago, and you said you wanted to go into business. How is that coming along? So you just stay in the question lane. Because questions and answers, it's a universal law. Questions and answers will always take everybody. Even this program is made up of questions and answers. Questions and answers will always take everybody right where they need to be. Might not take anybody where they want to go, but questions and answers will take everybody right where they should be. That's a law of the universe. There's no exceptions to that law. All you got to do is just keep pumping the questions. Now, once you start making statements, that starts an argument. So stay away from making statements. Lots of people make statements. I make statements. And every time I do, I'm getting into the danger zone if I don't want to lead to an argument. But if I stay in that question lane, I will wind up exactly where I should be. And the other person that I'm talking to will wind up exactly where that person wants to be. And it may not be where neither of, neither one of us want to be, but it'll take us where we should be because that's the whole nature in the universe of questions and answers. And if you don't believe it, try it. All right. Hold that thought right there. We've got to take a, a little short break, and we've got some more folks who want to speak to you. Out there, you too can join this discussion with Neely Fuller, Jr. Our number is 800-450-7876. Take your calls next right here on FM. 95.9 and also AM 1450 WOL, where information is power. And thank you for staying with us. We'll get back to Neely Fuller in a moment. Just let me remind you, some of the other people are going to be stopping by in the next uh, few days. Metaphysician Dr. B is going to join us. Also, some of the uh, uh, M- uh, Major League Baseball greats, some of the uh, older ones, uh, elder ones, if you will. I know they're in town for the All-Star game this weekend. I know Willie Randolph is in town, and Dave uh, Winfield's also in town as well. So maybe they'll join us as well. They said they will. We'll see. 800-4500-7876. That's the number to call right now to speak to Neely Fuller Jr., though. Let's go to line one. Roots is calling us from Maryland. Roots, you're on with Neely Fuller Jr. Greetings, greetings, Brother Carl. Greetings, Dr. Fuller. Um, I was listening a little earlier on to your question and answers for the gentleman that called about his wife and the situation with him in the home and religion. You're, I'm, I'm trying to phrase the question. I don't know if I have it directly, but I'm trying to get a better understanding of your response to the conclusion, which is the line of belief that is trying to be imposed. And the understanding that one should go away with from reaching that conclusion or that understanding that that's what the person is trying to achieve? Well, the main thing that I say, if I understand your question, is just that third question in the series that I say is should limit uh, arguments about religion or eliminate arguments about religion. That's, that's That was my purpose for trying to codify that. And you just ask the name of the person's religion, and then ask, number two, what does the person's religion require them to do? Is, is that person's religion? Most religions have requirements. It might be some religions that don't have any requirements. I don't know of any. haven't heard of any. But, you know, the person can tell you that. Well, my religion doesn't have any requirements, Okay. But most religions have requirements, so you want to be familiar with the requirements. What are the requirements? Requirements as it pertains to what? All areas of activity. Economics. What does your religion require you to do in the area of economics? The use of time and energy and money, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? Anything dealing with economics, what does your religion require you to do? Who you buy, uh, buy from? Who you sell to? What are the items? Okay. Education. What does your religion require you to do when you educate people? What do you teach? Okay. How much of what? What do you teach to be for? What do you teach to be against? Entertainment. Some religions have forms of entertainment. 
you know, among some black people, you know, in the Baptist church and all like that, the forms of entertainment is a part of the religion. And the entertainment, they say, well, we're going to have entertainment tonight at our church. And what are we going to have? We're going to have uh, some spiritual singers from such and such a church who are guests here in the city. And they're coming over. All right. But that's, you know, that's a part of our religion. And that's a part of our entertainment. We entertain it. And after then, we're going to have a banquet in the basement in which we're going to serve uh, chicken and sauerkraut or whatever. Okay. Now, so that person has given you the answer. You know, that's how we entertain ourselves. Okay. In my religion. You know, that's not the way that other people do it. But that's the way we do it over here at such and such a Baptist church. Okay. Now, you got that. Then they move on to the other areas of activity. Law. What does your religion say about obeying the laws and whose laws? And, you know, and uh, what does your religion say about, hey, slaves obey your masters? All right, is that a part of your religion? You know, and let them tell you. And don't argue about the answers that you get. See, because that starts an argument, in which case a lot of people love religious arguments. Don't feed into that. That's a no-no. We need to stop that altogether. Never argue about anything dealing with religion. Never. And how do you prevent that? Stay in the question lane. See, when you're asking questions, you're not arguing. Because the other person is listening to your questions and answering the questions according to their choice. So if it's an argument, they're arguing with themselves. Because you're not arguing. You're just asking questions. That's the key. Stay in the question lane. And then last but not least, after you go through all the nine areas of activity of finding out what that person's religion requires him or her to do, then you ask the bottom line question. What does your religion require you to do when you interact with me in all of these areas of activity, including how you interact with me according to my religion? Because you may have a religion already, okay? So you want to know, what does your religion require you to do when you encounter me? And my religion is not the same as yours. I want to know what your religion requires you to do. And don't interfere with the answer. And don't argue with the answer. You already have your answer. You want to know what the other person's answer is going to be. And then prepare yourself accordingly. That's it. I stick to that. And I haven't had any problem at all. all right. um, and I, I have a religion, I by the way. Yes. I think I understand up until that point. What I'm trying to get at is, let's say in terms of Christianity, which was what the example was, and that person trying to impart on the other, no, the belief in Jesus Christ. This is where my, I think my question is more directed, because your response sounded more like an acceptance of that. Well, see, here's what. We get lost in the rhetoric because we don't stick to the questions. See, if a person says, for instance, because I don't know what the person said to you, but I would know what to say because I'm going to stick to the code. All right? If the person says to me, I'm going to stay in the question lane. Do you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? My answer is another question. What do you mean by that? Accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And don't interfere with the answer. And let the person tell you. The person is offering you something, you know, probably. You know, you don't know what the person is doing until you ask. You've got to ask rather than start making statements. Right away, people, arguments start when a person say, oh, you know, you know, accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I mean, you know, what is, I mean, you know, I, I mean, you know, you, you, you're talking a bunch of nonsense. Now you're attacking the person and all like that, and that goes nowhere. That, that doesn't produce anything. We should stop that right this minute. Don't do not one more minute of that. Listen to the person and say what. And by and then when you speak, put it in the form of a question. What do you mean, sir? 
by accepting Jesus as my Lord and Savior. By doing what? See, for us, it always comes down to action. A C T I O N. Not all the rhetoric. It comes down to what do you do? What is the person trying to get you to do? The person is trying to get you to do something. That's why the person is talking to you. They made that clear. So what do I do? And don't help them with the answer. Let them tell you. And I don't know what they're going to say because, you know, this is a hypothetical thing that we're doing right now. But if the person, you know, I've experienced a person saying, well, be baptized. All right. Oh, okay. Be baptized by doing what? They say, well, they put you on the water. They sprinkle some water on you and whatnot. And you confess that, you know, to your sins or et cetera. These are the requirements and whatnot. You say, okay, in order for what? For Jesus to be your Lord and Savior and you to accept that. And these are the requirements? And the person says, yes. Then you say, well, I haven't done that. See, I don't know what you're going to say. I mean, you know, you can, but you can say that. That's a statement, you know, or you can put it in the form of a question. What if I haven't done that? And then let them tell you what the results are going to be if you haven't done that. Okay? So you say, well, you know, whatever you got to say, but stay in the question lane. Do not argue about religion, period, except one religion. There's one religion I'll argue. Well, I would discuss. I don't even argue about that. But it's one religion I will discuss ad infinitum, like I've been doing all this afternoon. And that is the religion of white supremacy. That's the name of it. Because that's the most powerful religion that the world has ever seen. There's no religion more powerful than that. According to what? Neely Fuller? No. According to evidence. Because I have seen all kinds of people cut corners on what they say is their own religion when the white supremacists come around and say, your religion conflicts with my business. So you are going to have to modify this and this when it comes to sexuality. Even though you have been doing this and this and this for years, you ain't doing that no more. Not on my watch. Not under my religion. My religion is the most powerful in the world. It's called the religion of white supremacy. And you dark-skinned people no longer are going to do what you are doing according to my religion. I don't care what your religion is. You are going to do what I say. I don't care what your religion is if you're a person of color. You are going to do what I say like I'm your religion. And any of you that fail to do that, you know what has happened to you in the past and it will happen to you in the future. Now, if you don't believe it, and this is what the white supremacists will say, because I've seen it happen over and over again. If you don't believe it, try me. You try your religion up against mine and see what happens. And most most people, unfortunately, of any religion, if they are people of color, they capitulate. They back down from the white supremacists when they speak and say, oh, you say this is a part of your religion? Well, it was a part of your religion until they start interfering with my business, which is white supremacy. So you can no longer practice that. Now, what do you got to say to that, boy? And most black people, all the black people I've ever seen, say, well, uh, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, you know I, it looks like I'll have to go along with it because that's what you say the law is. What law? The law according to what the religion is that you say you had? No, according to the white supremacist religion. Now observe it for yourself and see if that doesn't happen in any one of the areas of activity that the white supremacists choose. And right now, all over the world, among dark-skinned people, they are changing the laws of sex. S-E-X. Everywhere where there are dark-skinned people. And dark-skinned people are saying, well, my Bible tells me, or my book, my holy book tells me, or it's been passed on in my tribal religion that we don't do this. And the white supremacists say, you're going to do it now. <laughs> if you don't believe it, you're going to feel my wrath. You're going to do it now. 
Right. Meaningful, Jim, we, we, we just about run out of time. And Roots, thank you for your call. And folks, you got to call early because, uh, you know, I'm, I apologize for those who didn't get a chance to, to ask Neely Fuller Jr. a question. Hopefully you guys understood what he said. If not, just listen to the rebroadcast and maybe you can grasp three things because I got to admit, I didn't get it the first time around, but I figured it out. But Neely Fuller Jr., before we let you go, how can we put, get our hands on the book and what's the title of the book? The title of the book is called The Compensatory Counter-Racist Code, but it's not available right now on ProduceJustice.com. But write that down, ProduceJustice.com. That's the only way you can get it except through a couple of black bookstores, and it's just a couple, I think, uh, by the distributors. That's what they told me. But you can get it by going to ProduceJustice.com in about two and a half weeks. It'll be available right. again. Right now, they are out. All right, cool. We got to run. Stay strong. Stay positive. We'll see you tomorrow at 4 o'clock right here on FM 95.9 and AM 1450. WOL, where information is power.